So hi everybody, welcome along to another author event from Braille House and Bookshop 507. Today we are joined by Tia Cooper. Hi, welcome, thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure, thank you for the invitation. Excellent. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I write Australian historical fiction for HarperCollins. Nice. And in a past life, I was a teacher and a journalist and a farmer. But wow. these days, I can... <laughs> alpaca farmer, even. Oh, no. Um, yeah, well, yes and no. Um, <laughs> but these days, I haunt museums and indulge my passion for storytelling. <laughs> yeah, nice one. And uh, what inspired you to write books? Well, I've always been a great reader. And like so many other people, you know, one day I was always going to write a book. The long drawn out version of it is on my website, which I saw that you'd put up. So everybody yeah. can read that for themselves. But having gone through that, one day I decided that if I didn't get going, I'd run out of time. So I took 12 months long service leave from my teaching position. And as they say, the rest is history. Wow. And um, what draws you to write historical fiction? Is it how much research do you have to do? It's quite a different <laughs> genre to, it's not just sitting down and writing a story. No, well, the, fir the first book that I wrote was a contemporary romance and it was published as an e-book. But by that time, I, I live in a place called Wollombi in New South Wales. Um, it's in the Hunter Valley and it's a very quaint, historic little town. And I kept hearing stories about the past because the town's now been bypassed. It's, you know, it's, and it stayed very much as, as it was in the 19th century. Um, and everybody kept telling me stories about it. And so I took one of those stories and fictionalised it. And then I wrote another one, and both of those were being were published as ebooks. They're, they're short story, well, fifty thousand words as opposed to one hundred, one hundred and twenty thousand words. Um, and I just kept going. And the, my fourth book sort of grew like topsy, and I pitched that, and it was picked up, and so it was pick, uh, it was it went to print because mostly books that go to print need to be about at least a hundred thousand words usually, mm -hmm. um, and that was that. But I do do an awful lot of research. Um, but I do set all my books in the Hunter Valley, which is sort of cheating a little bit. Um, <laughs> or most of the story is set in the Hunter Valley. And that way, I, I rely quite heavily on the stories that I hear and the interesting bits and pieces that I'm told. Um, and then I follow them up. And that's the research that takes the time. But yeah. my characters are always fictional. But yeah. I'd like to set them in the correct historical time frame and include historical fact because I think it gives it a degree the story a degree of authenticity you know, it, make, it makes the the characters lives feasible yeah um, and yeah so that's the research that I do yeah, <laughs> a lot well, of poking around and, and the writing process is it um <laughs> how does that come about is it sort of sit down and bash it out or is it get a bit of inspiration do some research no, it's a, bit, it's a bit of everything. It's, it's been my full-time occupation for about five or six years now. Um, and I have to admit, after 35 years in the classroom, it's my <laughs> greatest pleasure not to work to a timetable. <laughs> but now that I'm writing a book a year, it means that I actually have three stories on the go most of the time. Um, uh, so I'm talking to people about The Girl and the Painting, which came out in January. Mm -hmm. I've just finished the edits on my November release, The Cartographer's Secret, which will come out November 2020. Mm -hmm. And I'm about halfway through the first draft of my 2021 release, The Paleontologist. Wow. So you're know, sort of juggling a whole lot of things that are going on. Um, plus That's a good analogy. <laughs> yeah, well, no, it really is. Uh, I have been known to muddle up the names, you know, when I'm halfway through <laughs> the end. Um, um, I yeah. sort of like to say that I work five days a week. But okay. it's not Monday. It's not Monday to Friday, and often, if I'm lucky, you know, working day includes a bit of an excursion or a research trip or chatting to the locals. So it's it's a tough life. Really. Nice. <laughs> and and you just showed us the um, the cover there of the girl on the painting. It's beautiful. Mm. Can you tell me about how you you um, connected with the illustrators or the people that well, did your cover art? HarperCollins Design Studio do my cover art. Okay. Um, because they publish, I, I don't know, they're fantastic. <laughs> I just can't, I just can't 
can't fail them. They just seem to get my stories. And I don't think there's a cover that I haven't fallen in love with. I've just been very blessed. Yeah, well, on that, are you able to show us some of the others? Oh, I can. Okay, so we've got, we've got the girl in the painting. And before that came the woman in the green dress. Yes, yep. And before that, the naturalist's daughter. Beautiful. And oh, I haven't got them in the right order, but this is really impressive. <laughs> before that, the currency lass. Mm -hmm. And before that, the cedar cutter. Nice, yep. And the first one that went to print, the horse thief. Beautiful. The others, the others I can't show you um, copies of. Yep. You have to go and have them online. Yeah. Let me just get rid of these before I knock everything flying. Yeah, very good. And um, for a first time author, was there any advice that you would give them or somebody that's thinking about starting to write perhaps? Yes, yes, I could say write <laughs> and write as much and as often as you can. Yep. Read, read as widely as you can, particularly in the genre you want to write in. Yep. And, you know, as an aside, if you're writing historical fiction, read the journals and newspapers and novels of the time because that gives you a really good feel for the period. Mm -hmm. And basically, mix and repeat. Yeah, and, experiment. and experiment. Yeah, right. And um, you said, mentioned that you're a lover of museums. Um, what are some of your favourites and what makes a good museum? Well, I'm a bit biased. I, wall I volunteered at a local museum in Wallenby. Oh, no. So that, well, that's <laughs> got to be my favourite museum. <laughs> and there are so many things in that museum that have slipped into my story, oh, stories over the years. And I really like small museums. I often, you know, search them out when we're doing research trips and things like that because they, they tell you much more about domestic life, mm -hmm. which is incredibly useful when you're, um, you know, reading, when you're, when you're writing that sort of a story. Mm -hmm. But that being said, I did find another favourite which I just like museum. But when I was writing The um, Girl in the Painting, a section of that book goes out to Hill End, which is one of the gold mining towns in New South Wales. And they have the most amazing... I'd been there before, but the museum was... Well, it, the building had been completely renovated and, and the contents, just everything had changed. And it's... Well, as I said, it's an interactive museum and it's got the most amazing photographs that were taken in the mid to late 19th century. And they're, they're huge. They're spread all yeah. over the walls and everything else. And at the same time, they have this co constant soundtrack going of the noise as it would, would have been in the past yeah. with the damper batteries and all sorts of things like that. And it's sort of like a sound and light show. It's yeah. absolutely incredible. It sounds really immersive, like you've... Yes, it, 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 it's really, it's, it's in what looks like a rather modern shearing shed, tin shed or whatever, but you walk in and you simply step back in time and you can just sit there with this big screen and it's, it's incredible. Wow. Um, and, yeah, well, and obviously other museums, obviously the Australian Museum and the Mitchell Library, does that count as a museum? They're my favourite place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And um, so can you give us some examples of um, where you've drawn inspiration from food books? Is it like just a little thing, little bit that sparks it? Yeah. Um, so let's go back to the first one, the first yeah. historical I wrote, Lily's Leap, because that's a, that's a great example. It, that very much drew on a local story. Um, I don't know whether any of your listeners have ever been to Walton by, but there's a road, the original old road that was built by the convicts in 1830, I can't remember, um, winds in from Sydney. And it's very, very steep. And there's, because it cuts into the edge of the, the cliff in mm -hmm. some place. And there's one particularly nasty bend, which everybody drives through today, but you, have to, you still have to be really, really careful. Um, and it's called Ramsey's Leap. So I wanted to know who Ramsey was, didn't I? Um, and he was actually a convict and he was being taken into Wallenby because that's where, at that time that's where the courthouse was to, to stand trial. And he was on horseback and he got two policemen troopers guarding him or whatever and he got to that corner and he just took off and went straight over the edge yeah. and away so I nicked that 
<laughs> Lily has nearly Lily has a very similar experience, but not quite the same. Um, so that you know, that that's the sort of thing I do. The the horse thief, which I showed you just now, is actually based on a rural myth. I was down at the local tavern in Wollombi, and somebody and it was Melbourne Cup time, and somebody said, "Oh yeah, Archer, you know, the first cup, the first horse to win the Melbourne Cup, was yeah. born and bred in the Hunter Valley." Oh. I thought, oh, it's funny, I didn't think he was. Anyway, I went and looked it up and he wasn't. Um, <laughs> but it did, and that's the beauty of writing fiction, it did, give, it did kickstart the story of the horse thief. Um, but at the end of all my books, I always, I should have to show you in one of these, I always have a historical note, which, find it, which can be found at the end. And I always admit to what is fact and what is fiction. So don't <laughs> leave them out. To the end. <laughs> the end yes, and you, may, you, mustn't, you mustn't read it until the end, but I do know that there are some people who go to that bit first, but it's always so I have to be terribly careful when, you know, spoilers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and as a writer, what do you think the best piece of advice you've been given? Bum glue. I got uh -huh. you. Bum glue sitting and staying oh, no. there. Yeah. It's a dreadful, dreadful expression, but it's so true. <laughs> you know, you just, you've just got to sit there and you write. And some days it works, yeah. some days it doesn't, and you write some more, and you write. And so the best advice I was given was, A, use bum glue, and B, you can't edit a blank page, and you so can't. Fair enough. You know, well. How bad it is, but if you've got something down there, you've got to start. It's just yeah. getting over that blank page. Yeah, all right. And um, would you just, um, not just writing, but what advice would you give the younger you? <laughs> Stop procrastinating. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I left it far too late. I, sh I should have. I, if there's anything I regret, I, I regret the fact that I procrastinated and didn't have the courage of my, I didn't have the time in actual fact, but um, yeah, just do it. Just do it. That's just good, good advice. Do it. Oh, and possibly learn patience too i'm not the most patient person in the world and things in, in the publishing world tend to move quite slowly certainly initially yeah right and what advice um would you give our audience about like writing a book but also the the next bit getting published because lots of people write books but don't sort of get that next step so do you have any advice there yeah, I mean, if you have actually written a book and finished it, congratulate yourself. That's a huge milestone. You've actually finished it, you know, and so many people don't. And it's, it, it's, that's possibly the hardest thing to do, which brings me back to the, you can't edit a bank page. Um, so, you know, that, that's, that's absolutely fabulous. So you're one, you know, you've got one step on the, on the ladder, if you like. Um, the next thing I'd really advise people to do is to join a writing group. Um, in fact, several. I, um, particularly the larger ones, are, but it, obviously it has to be relevant to the kind of stories that you're writing. And I'm talking fiction here. I'm not talking, yeah. I, I can't talk about the others. Um, but I belong to the Romance Writers of Australia, the Historical Novel Society of Australasia, Sisters in Crime, and the Australian Writers' Centre. Um, and then that's fantastic. And a lot, you know, a lot of that's done online. Um, but then you also need a middle size, right? You know, a writer's group where you can actually meet like-minded people, share your writing, which is one of the hardest things to do, mm -hmm. and talk about your writing. Um, and then maybe even a local group, you know, a much smaller writing group, and maybe people that you know, or a book club, but just mm -hmm. so you're immersing yourself in, in writing. Yeah. And then, oh, and then, and then, then, you've got to decide how you want to be published. Do you want to be traditional? Traditionally published, self-published, print book, audio, ebook, all yeah. of the above. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's so so many alternatives, but that's where the groups that you join, the larger groups, can be an enormous amount of help because many of them they have they give you the opportunity to pitch directly to publishers. That's how I got the horse seed published as part of the group. Yeah, it, yeah. because they held a conference and I. I booked a pitch, a five minute pitch. It's like sort of like speed dating on steroids. It's the most <laughs> terrifying thing I've ever done. Um, but it gets you face to face and there with a publisher. Yeah. Um, 
a lot of the large publishers have one day a week where they take submissions and 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 there are lots of other other events but it, the ability if you if you get the chance to pitch a book do it um otherwise you just got you can you know submit it to the other ones but then you go into the slush pile and there's yeah. an awful lot of work yeah I, um, reading seems to be more and more important, not just as an escape, but also to learn about the world that we're living in. Why do you think reading is so important? Well, pretty much what you said. I can't imagine a life without books. I mean, look, right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's a form of escapism for me, um, but it's also a way to learn about other places and other times. And as a writer, I, fi I find that it, it allows my imagination to Rome, if you like, you know, wander down paths that I perhaps hadn't thought about. Yeah. Um, what sort of books do you read yourself? Good question. Um, I'm one of those... I can see your shelf. <laughs> yeah, well, you have a look. Um, but you can't see all of them, fortunately, yeah. or the other bookshelves. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm one of those people that reads everything from the back of the cornflake packet to the New Scientist or the Financial Review or never, you know. And then I always have this huge pile of books by my bed. Um, usually they're, they're a mixture of fiction and research books. Um, I pretty re much read, well, I, I read a lot of historicals, obviously. I read, I read some contemporaries. I like thrillers. Mm -hmm. um, I always say that I don't read fantasy. But if you ask me my favourite book, I'll tell you it's Lord of the Rings. Yeah. And if you can, I don't know if you'll see it, but I've got I've got every you know book that goes with it as well. You know all of them. Yeah. <laughs> no. um, so yeah, I just read everything. Yeah. Um, I, you know, sometimes I'll start reading something and not like it, but basically I I, I read an awful lot. And um, you mentioned a book that you have coming out in November. And um, what else? Yes. What else have you got? Um, coming out? What's in the making? Well, the cartographer's secret's almost done. Um, and that'll be, it tells the story of a girl who lived in the shadow of her father's obsession with Ludwig Leichhardt, the explorer. Um, and it's set pretty much set in the Hunter Valley. Um, my 2021 book, which I'm about halfway through, well, halfway through the first draft of, um, is, is about a paleontologist. That's set in the Hunter too at a place called Bow Wow Gorge. I saw a photograph, I think it's an English photograph, but of this group of women trailing through what looked like the bush. Um, I think it was taken in, in 19, late 19th century. And, and they were actually a group of women paleontologists. And I looked at that and I thought, there's a story in that. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. And, um, and then I discovered that there is a place called Bow Wow Gorge in the Hunter that um, where you can't go, well, it's, it's under a um, conservation order now, but there's a lot of fossils and things there. So I thought, oh, I could combine the two perhaps, because I do like keeping them in the Hunter. It makes it so much easier. And is it the same place or a different place, the Wollamai Pine? Is that? No, it's a different place. That's in, that's in um, th this is Wollamai with a B. Oh, uh, yeah. By Wollamai, whereas Wollamai Pine is, and that's in the Blue Mountains, which isn't that far away. Well, that's but, a thought, yeah. yeah. But not, 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 no, not this area, and that's not why the place is called Wollamai. It's, um, it's actually a meeting place. It, it used to be an indigenous meeting place, um, and there um, are three fairly large watercourses that meet in, in Wollamai, and people have been coming here forever, and there's some very significant indigenous sites and stuff like that in the area. Yeah, right. Probably need a car no. for myself. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. So you need, you need a Well, <clears throat> here, here's, here's a little bit of inside information that not a lot of people know about, but there's going to be a map inside the cartographer's secret, inside oh. the book that shows the area. So there you go. Oh. But you know, this is not to be discussed enormously, but you can leave it on that. That's a little treat for everybody. <laughs> nice, a little teaser. Well, mm. just on that, are you able to um, read us a little bit from one of your books? Oh, I thought I'd read you a bit from The Girl and the Painting. Yes, great. Um, it, this story, it tells the story of a woman called Miss Elizabeth Quinn and a young girl called Jane, who she, who's... Elizabeth Quinn is sort of a pillar of society. You know? She's known throughout the town as being the person to know and... 
everything else. And Jane is an orphan girl that she takes under her wing. Um, how long do you want me to go on for? Oh, <laughs> have a page or two? Yes, a page. Um, yeah, and so this is the bit where Jane, who has been brought up in an orphanage, oh, I should say, Jane's been brought up in the orphanage, um, and the reason that she's come to Elizabeth's attention is that she is mm, a mathematical, not genius, but she's way ahead of herself, and she's quite besotted by numbers. Mm -hmm. So, still got, oh no, Maitland Town, which is just up the road. 1906. Still glowing from the scrubbing Sister Mary Ann had administered, Jane stood quaking on the doorstep of the Queen's Church Street house and rang the bell. Noisier than a fire engine, it filled the entire street. She whipped around in case anybody was coming running, but no one had, so she turned back to the door. It opened to reveal a red-faced girl done up like a leg of lamb in a butcher's shop her frilly little cap and ruffled apron so white it made Jane squint. Better come in, and none of your nonsense. Think you're some kind of clever sticks, aren't they? Lucy Smith. So that's what happened to her. The Queens must make a habit of choosing girls from the orphanage. Well, Mr Quinn could forget it. She wasn't going to prance around in a get-up like that. Besides, she'd be no good at it. It went bobbing and curtsying. Before Jane had time to respond to Lucy's smart remark, Mr. Queen's booming voice echoed down the long hallway. Right on time, good girl. He's supposed to have an Irish accent, but I can't do Irish accent. <laughs> right on time, good girl. Off you go, Lucy. With her nose twitching, Lucy scurried off, leaving Jane in the doorway with no idea what to do next. Come along, come and meet Elizabeth. Mr. Queen beckoned, and she tiptoed along the patterned carpet runner down the hallway, hands clasped tightly. Some sort of paper covered the walls on either side of her, painted with what looked like flannel flowers. There had to be at least 512 flowers in the space between the front door and the spot where Mr. Quinn stood. At his invitation, she stepped over the threshold and into a fairy tale. Miss Elizabeth Quinn sat on a small rose patterned sofa next to the window, looking like some kind of angel with the sun behind her. Hair the color of roasted chestnuts, loose curls swept back from her face, and her eyes. She had the brightest blue eyes, almost violet, putting Jane in mind of the doll she and Emmeline had seen in Owen and Beckett's shop last Christmas, all porcelain skin and shiny blue. Emmeline reckoned the doll's eyes opened and closed. My name is Elizabeth, Elizabeth Quinn. I'm Michael's sister. She patted the cushion next to her on the sofa. It was the palest of pinks, just like the inside of a real rose. How do you do, miss? Jane tried to do one of those curtsy things, but her stock, stocking started to slither. Did Mr. Quinn truly want her to sit? Sorry, did Miss Quinn truly want her to sit next to, to her? Come and sit by me. We girls must stick together. Michael, you sit opposite us. Miss Quinn picked up a small bell from the table next to her and gave it a shake. Two seconds later, Lucy Smith returned, bobbing in the doorway like a foraging duck. Yes, ma'am? She shot Jane a disparaging look. I think I'll stop there. Hey, well, yeah. No, I'm into it. I'm into it. Yeah. Well, you will have to buy it. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> Available at okay. local bookshops. Yeah. Nice. No, well, just on that, where can people buy your books? In all good bookshops. In all good um, bookshops. And places like Booktopia and Book Depository, pretty much, you know. Seriously, where all good, where good books are sold. Um, and obviously the digital books are available through Amazon and Apple and Google yeah. Play and yeah. those kind of things. Yeah. Um, really the best thing to do is to check out my website. It's where I get to do a plug. TiaCooperAuthor.com uh, Each book there has got its own, uh, each, on the website, each book has its own page and it carries the blurb, blurb and all the buy links. Um, I have got a few signed copies that people can buy directly from me. But you can check that out on the website. Nice. Yes. TiaCooperAuthor.com. Yep, that's it. Done. Excellent. Look, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been really great to hear, get your insight and, um, and hear about your books and um, what goes into them. It's been amazing. So thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for the invitation and thank you to everybody for listening. Um, and if you're a writer, you've got to remember, read, write, repeat. 
And if you're a reader and you've read any of my, book, my books, I'd love to hear what you think. So please stay in touch. And you can find me on Facebook or Instagram. And the details Perfect. are on my website. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much, Tia. Have yourself a beautiful day. And um, for all of our readers from Braille House and Bookshop 507, make sure you get out and, and read some Tia Cooper straight away. Oh, can yeah. I say something? One last thing. An awful lot of my books are available in large print. Nice. I don't know whether that's significant or not, but I just... Yeah, it is. Of course. Yes. yes. Anyway. Okay. Oh, fantastic. All right. Well, thank you so thank much. Have a great day. Bye-bye.